Well, I don't know if you have ever had a stump problem, but stumps are a lot of work to get rid of. Uh, one time I had a stump problem in a front yard, and I looked into what it would take to get rid of this stump that was killing all the grass around it, and I did not enjoy what I found out. It is, at best, a three-day process to do it yourself. There's drilling of holes, there's pouring of poison, and even when you do that, there's no guarantee that you're not going to kill, still kill everything else around it. And I had a lot of other problems at the same time. Uh, there was gutters to fix, there were rooms to paint, there was trim to fix. There was a lot of other work to do, like, you know, that would take one hour, two hours, a day at the most, and then there's this stump. And you just think, oh, man, I think I want to forget about that stump. I don't think I want to go near that stump. Uh, I don't know that it's really worth the time, and I've got other things to think about. A stump is at the center of this text. In fact, it's, it's been with us for a while. Last week, we talked about chapter 6. And chapter 6 is Isaiah's calling. Isaiah goes into the throne room of God and, and sees God's presence. Well, as much of it can fit, anyway. The, the hem of God's garment fills the room. And seraphim with six wings cry out as God's presence fill the room. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And God says, will anyone go speak for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. The seraphim then flies down, puts a burning hot coal on Isaiah's mouth, and he's purified. And then God tells him, your ministry will be completely unsuccessful. No one will listen to you. The harder you work, the more they'll, they'll turn away. And uh, Isaiah asks that question, till when, oh God? And God says, there's going to be a stump. That the growing oak tree of God's people, the promise of Abraham, that his descendants would be as many as the stars in the heaven or the sand on the seashore. And it's like a growing oak tree with branches branching out. And you're going to preach Isaiah until that oak tree is cut down and is a stump. So we've got a stump problem today. We've got a cut-off problem. And, and stumps, cut-off problems they are really just easier to ignore. <laughs> there are other things to take care of. Life has lots of daily problems that we can actually address. And so I don't know where you've been cut off. I don't know where in your life you have felt just the brutal axe. Just chop it down. But if you're like me, uh, it's easier to go focus on other things. It's easier to go to work every day and to address the issues of family and work and, and friends than to think about that problematic relationship I have. Uh, the brother or sister that I just don't really want to call. Uh, the friend who maybe cut me off and and. I don't even know if I go and if I have an honest conversation with them, if they'll even listen. It's too risky. It's too much work. I really don't want to go take care of these places in my life where I have been cut off and cut down. And so I'll just go focus on other things. I think this is where we are here in the 11th chapter. Maybe just months, maybe just years after Isaiah has received his calling to go and to have the world's least successful ministry of prophecy. But there is a complicated situation in, in southern Israel, in what is called Judah. Here, here's basically, I'm going to try to be brief here, because I've been told stuff that I nerd out on isn't all that fun and interesting. But I think it's pretty interesting, okay? At this point, we live in what is called the divided kingdom. Kingdom. The northern kingdom, 
the northern part of Israel, is what's called the Ten Tribes, the Ten Northern Tribes. And at this time, their king is King Pekah. And King Pekah has made an alliance. The, the empires around them are growing. They are not what they used to be. But King Pekah has made an alliance with the king of Damascus to their north and their east. And he has said, if you'll protect us, we'll pay you tribute. And this may not sound like a problem to us, right? We, we have uh, alliances with other countries and it was generally seen as a good thing, a peacemaking thing. But for Israel to make an alliance is to implicitly say, we have stopped trusting you, God. We don't think that you're going to protect us anymore. So instead of paying tribute to you, instead of being covenant faithful to you, we are going to make a promise, a covenant, with another king. And this is what the ten tribes in the north, the northern kingdom, has done. At the same time, the southern kingdom is Judah. And that's where Jerusalem is. This is where Isaiah is giving his, his life to prophecy and, and trying to get the king Ahaz of Judah, of Jerusalem, to listen, to remember God, to not forget God. But Ahaz is in a tough spot. He has a lot of things to focus on. It is easy to forget God when life is difficult. When the northern tribes make this alliance, they start having these northern battle skirmishes on Judah's northern, northern border. For the first time, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, they're not at all at war, but they're, they're looking each other eye to eye. Well, the kingdoms to the south of Judah, the Philistines and, and others, they say, well, here's our opportunity. And so they start doing little skirmishes and little battles and little tests poking at Jerusalem, and they start trying to invade their land. And so Ahaz has a dilemma. I'm fighting with my own brothers to the north, and my troops need to be dedicated up there, and now to my south, I, I'm having, I'm having to, to watch my flank there too. Meanwhile, in the east, the empire of Assyria Modern-day Iraq, sometimes referred to as Babylon, is growing and growing and growing, and they are ruthless. And so, Ahaz, though he rejects uh, the, the advances of the other kings, he gets to a spot where he just has to make a compromise. And he says to, to the kingdom of Assyria, we want to make an alliance. We want you to come protect us. And in a matter of years, all of Israel's wealth is gone to Assyria. They have run out of things to pay their protectors. And so they begin to do the unthinkable. They begin to pawn the family heirlooms. They go into the temple where there's the gold that they took out of Egypt. The gold that has been turned into the worship instruments of God and they send them to Assyria to protect them. It's predictable what happens next. Syria's, their army's already there. They're looking around going, we're, we're already here. They've got nothing less, left to pay us. And so we'll just make this place ours. This is the fear that Isaiah is trying to get instilled into the mind of Ahaz. He's trying to say to him, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And Ahaz will not listen. And so it, Jerusalem becomes a stump. And it is difficult to want to go pay attention to the cutoff places in our lives. It's difficult for Jerusalem, for the faithful people of God to want to go back to those cut-off places. But Isaiah here in chapter 11 says, don't forget about those cut-off places because there's a promise there. There is a promise in those places in our lives we would like to ignore. That is where we can go and find a king, 
a hero who will not abandon us, who will not turn to other gods, who will lead us to the freedom and to the justice and to rest that our kings have not been able to do. Verse 1 in chapter 11 says, A shoot will come out from the stock of Jesse. A branch shall bloom from his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. A spirit of wisdom and insight, a spirit of counsel and valor, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, his very breath in the fear of the Lord. Isaiah says, it's like a terebinth, which I had to look up. You might know what a terebinth is, but a terebinth is like a pistachio tree. It's like a terebinth or an oak, Isaiah says. And it, it's cut down. It's a stump. But the seed of life is in the stump. Isaiah says there is a promise in those cut-off places in our lives. Go look for God. Go look for this king there. I want to point out something um, I find interesting. We, we lose some things in the parts of the Old Testament, especially that are poetry. It is difficult to translate um, word plays and entendre. But Isaiah is doing something here I think we need to pay attention to. Uh, the word for spirits is ruach, ruach. And if you're not coughing something up, you're not saying the final H right. Ruach. Spirit can also mean wind. And when you put a certain preposition in front of it, it means rest, to settle, like wind settling. Spirits, wind, breath. It's all this same word, and so is rest. So let me show you what happens when we have this understanding of of spirit, wind, breath, and rest, all being the same word. A shoot shall come out from the stalk of Jesse. A branch shall bloom from his roots. And the spirit, the ruach of God, of the Lord, shall rest on him. The spirit of the Lord, the breath of the Lord, the essence of the Lord will rest on him. Like it's nothing. Like it's just so easy. A spirit, the ruah of wisdom and insight. The spirit, a ruah of counsel and valor. A spirit, the ruah of knowledge and fear of the Lord. His very breath, his ruah, will be in the fear of the Lord. And then when this... This hero comes along, the one who's not like Ahaz, who's not like Pekka. When he comes along, there's going to be some weird stuff happen. There's going to be some weird stuff that starts happening. Some people go to this text and they go, well, see, no one is supposed to eat meat. You can even see, see when, when God comes back in glory that not even predatory animals are eating meat. And look, I have nothing against vegetarianism. But that is reading a 21st century value back into an ancient text. The point is not that aren't lions mean and they should stop. No, the point is it's going to get weird. That these animals who are predatory by nature will rest with domesticated animals. They will ruach with each other. And babies should not be playing with venomous snakes, we should all agree. But it's going to get weird when this person comes. Uh, they will rest together. We won't have to worry about it. It's not that, that a bear should just really stop you know, being a predator. It's just that what we have come to assume is normal. The, the violence of life that we've just come to accept the fear that we have just come to think is normal, well, when this hero comes, maybe it won't be so normal after all. 
maybe what we have come to say, yeah, we've just got to accept it and live with it. Maybe even those things will be turned upside down. And so Isaiah says, look, it's kind of easy to forget about God. There are other things to think about and occupy our time. And it is not easy to find God again once we have, for, once we have forgotten him. It is hard, but it is not mysterious. There is a promise at the cut-off places of our lives, the places we'd rather not go to. There, at a stump, there's just a little whisper of green growing out of that dry, dark, brown stump. There's just a little, little branch, and it's growing. It's growing. The the branch is not to be, the, the stump is not to be eliminated. It's not to be forgotten. It's to be returned to. Because it's the last things we would expect that will start happening when this hero returns. When this God comes back to visit us. The seed of life is in the stump. And so, I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what memories or dark parts of your story are just so difficult to return to. And it's strange. It's weird. It's a weird occurrence. I don't know if I can quite explain it. But I am convinced that when we return to those places of our lives where we have felt most cut off and cut down, we will see this whisper, this seed of life. So maybe it's really difficult for you to go visit the grave of a parent. They left without giving you a blessing. Maybe it's a brother or sister and you really don't want to pick up the phone. Maybe it's a brother or sister in Christ. Not, not all returning to... Hello? There are um, situations that you should not necessarily return to if it implies being unsafe. But how can you, in a safe way, in a way that honors your safety, your protection, how could you go visit those places? How could you go look for the seed of life in the very place where you have been most cut off and cut down. The seed of life grows up out of a stump. And when we examine that seed, we see in him spirit of God. The breath of God, the wind of God. And in its growth, there is justice and there is peace and in there, I think we will find rest. Um, there's a lot written lately about this being a time in our society when anxiety, worry is at an all-time high. That out of the pandemic, people in North America and the Western part of the world have just had skyrocketing rates of anxiety, and I do not pretend to be a mental health expert. But I wonder how much our ability to distract ourselves from the pain is preventing us from seeing the seed of life grow, from seeing impossible things in our lives happening, strange things, like the most fearful things becoming restful things. The most anxiety-producing moments of our lives being things that, uh, well, we'd let, our, we'd let our kids play with. I think that when we return in a way that makes sense for us, 
to the cutoff, the cut down places of our lives. That we will see what Isaiah calls the root of Jesse blowing, uh, growing out of a stump. We call that shoot, that, that branch, Jesus. And Jesus is the one who can make the cut off places in our lives be the very places that we go to find life. And so um, I'm going to take next week off. I've got some family coming in town. We're going to go spend some time with them. Bruce Utley has been kind enough to, to fill in for me next week. And so this, this is the end of this series, The Forgotten God. And, and we are going to turn the page and, and start uh, what is the Advent season uh, two weeks from now. And in Advent, uh, traditionally the church focuses on themes of waiting, of waiting on God. And we're going to do that, but we're going to change it a little bit. Our theme for Advent this year is going to be building off of the theme of this sermon series, The Forgotten God. There is such a thing as active waiting. Active waiting, and we might actually call that searching, looking for. And so this Advent, we are going to be searching for the forgotten God, and we are going to be looking for God in unexpected places. Because, as Isaiah tells us, that is where we will always find Jesus. Jesus is the one who walks out of a grave. Jesus is the one who is the shoot that grows up out of a stump. And we spend so much of our time looking at things to distract us, to keep us anything from going to the stump. And I think where God is leading us is to strange times. Times when we will actually go and find our hope of life in the very places where we've been cut down and cut off. So what does that look like? to go search for God in a forgotten place in your life. Can you journal this week? Could you turn, spend some time in silence this week in solitude with God and let yourself just, just mentally, just emotionally maybe, go a place you haven't been to in quite a while? Maybe if that goes well, you could do something like picking up a phone and calling somebody and saying, I'm sorry, and I just, want, I just want us to be right. Maybe you can't pick up a phone, maybe you can't call somebody, but maybe you could go physically visit a grave. Maybe you could go emotionally visit a grave and say some things that you haven't been able to say to somebody. I think that when we go to these forbidden places, these cut off and cut down places, we will find Jesus. And when we find Jesus in those places, we will find him resting in glory. And he invites us there to rest with him in the glory of God, where life is growing. Church, would you stand and receive this blessing? May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you this week, wherever he may send you. May he guide you in the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at all the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to these doors.